How many people are new this round that weren't here last time? Can you raise your hands if you're new? The last one, yeah, that's what I mean. So about five or six. So if I were to recap, um, <clears throat> probably the most important things that I said were uh, the value is determined by what we call salient attributes, and those are the observable attributes that collectively represent the value of an object. Some of the examples we had were a date, and the salient attributes were year, month, day, for a time, they were hours, minutes, seconds, and milliseconds. For a vector, they were the size of the vector and the respective element sequence in the vector, but not capacity, not its allocator, nothing that didn't correspond to what we would think of as a platonic ethereal type that we're trying to approximate in C++. Now, that was a long discussion, the ethereal type thing. And I also mentioned that that's the key point where Alex Stepanoff and I don't quite see eye to eye. Alex starts with the bits and says that the mapping of objects and their functions to other objects is it, the bits are, are, are the, the, the reality of the object, whereas I'm saying I don't care about the bits per se as long as there's an isomorphism between the operations in the ethereal type and the operations that are on the C++ type. And remember, the C++ type is only an approximation to the ethereal type, and there can be more than one approximation to the same ethereal type. And if you're trying to compare two objects to see if they have the same value, it's meaningless unless they are trying to approximate the same ethereal type. That's a lot of words, I know. <sighs> anyway. What else was important? Oh, yes. The essential property, I should probably go back. That's probably even worth going back for. Yeah, let's go back to that. OK. Yeah, this slide, this thing here. Um, if A and B have the same value today, and we do the same operation on A and B, and if they had the same value before and nothing funny happens, they will again have the same value. Otherwise, they never did. And the example I gave was, suppose you have two ordered sets with a constructor that takes a bit that tells you whether the order is increasing or decreasing. So I have, uh, uh, or I should say one ordered set that, that where, where the constructor has an increasing or decreasing bit. So I create two objects, one constructed with, uh, with zero, the other one constructed with one. They currently have no elements. And the question was, do they represent the same value? Even though they're empty. And then I, some people said yes, which they amended later to no. But because uh, an ordered set, an ordered set means a unique sequence. It doesn't mean an unordered sequence. OK, so ordered, ordered set means uh, a sequence of unique elements. So if I start with two empty uh, ordered unique or two, two, two unique sequences, and I add, um, uh, I add, let's say, five, now I'll have two sequences each with five. But when I add six, one of them will be five, six, and the other one will be six, five. And since it's an ordered thing, we know that order is salient, and therefore, they no longer have the same value. But we did the same thing to both of them. Therefore, they never had the same value. Or more importantly, they never modeled the same ethereal type. So you have to go look back to that. If they're not, no matter how you do it, if they're not modeling the same ethereal type, talking about whether they have the same value or not, is it meaningful in this modeling system? Anyway, yes? No, they don't. because. They don't have the same value because when you say one is increasing and one is decreasing, those are two different ethereal types. Even though they're the same C++ type, they're behaving differently based on the same inputs. It doesn't matter how it happens, whether it's templates or functors or bits or whatever, they behave differently. So the real, the real thing here is they don't have the same value because this property doesn't hold. All right. Mm -hmm.
I'm saying, I'm saying that they're not substitutable in the sense, if they're different types, if they're different types, then one could overflow where the other one doesn't. And we get to undefined behavior. So they're not substitutable in the same way, in the same sense that int is. They do model, they do model the same ethereal type, and it's a good point. But I'm saying that you can't, you can't make this statement about different types with, with, that are different approximations. In other words, yes, they, today they represent the same value, and I can take that value and I can move it to something else. But once they overflow, all bets are off. Well, the date classes, although I didn't put it in, I said that they would go from the year 111 to 1231-9999, and that's part of the contract or precondition or invariant on the date. That's English. But remember, if you operate the device outside of the contract, what do you want, you know? So yes, they are different approximations in the same way that int and short are. So if short doesn't overflow, we expect the same behavior. But if short overflows, we get undefined behavior, and then it doesn't work. So that's really what I'm saying. If they don't represent the same operations even without overflow, it's meaningless to talk about there being the same value. Then they could be different approximations to the same type, which means we would get, we would, it would be meaningful until the, one of them overflows. And then the, th right, the third one is they're the same type, and then you will get the same behavior to both all the time. All right, I'm going to get started. Good little refresher. Uh, get back to here. Okay, so we, we actually learned all of these wonderful little tidbits in the last class, and now we're gonna start to talk about how we design things. And in particular, let's look at a true mathematical type, a rational. And I've got a numerator and a denominator, and are these the salient attributes, numerator and denominator, or should I pick something else? One possibility is I could decide that the salient attribute is the ratio of the numerator and denominator, or correspondingly, some cross product between the two being considered. Or you take numerator times denominator over here equals numerator times denominator over there. It's a possibility, so let's take a look. Two rational objects have the same value if the ratio of the values of numerator and denominator for its LHS is the same as, for that, as that for its RHS. So in that model, these two would have the same value. This doesn't matter because we just say, ah, that's, we don't care. We could. These would also have the same value. But the problem is, what about this? And now you maybe see what's going to happen. What if I raise them both to the 10th power? Now one of them overflows and one of them doesn't. So I've got two, two instances of the same C++ type alleging to have the same value, and yet one of them overflows and one of them doesn't. And that's a problem. So this is design advice. If you, if you do this, you will be disappointed sometimes because you'll do some sort of substitution and it, it won't behave the way you thought it was gonna behave. So I argue this is a bad design, and it violates what we're trying to achieve. It's probably a bad idea. The right thing to do is maintain them in some sort of canonical order. The problem with, uh, the problem with doing this kind of canonical stuff, though, is uh, it, it is expensive. If you're constantly updating an object every time you do something with it, you're, you may be pay paying a price that you would rather do in batch. So this becomes a more specific problem, but it's just a heads up. Um, the idea is if you have attributes that, that, that contribute to value, then individually corresponding attributes should have the same value, not have some interpretation of them on aggregate that turns out to make the two objects have the same value. Again, that's design advice. We could fix this another way. We could say that the numerator and denominator are infinite precision integers. If we do that, this problem goes away because there is no hard boundary that can overflow. Does that make sense? Okay, all right. When should we omit valid syntax? So, we have a graph. Now, we could implement a graph in a number of ways. 
And this is here just to remind people that I'm into physical design and I don't like cyclic dependencies. And so there are many ways to fix this. This one is with opaque pointers. Uh, this is with dumb data. Uh, I could change the order so that the node knows about the node iterator and the graph knows about both. Uh, but for the purposes of this discussion, I'm going to make it as simple as I possibly can because that's not why we're here. So here I have a graph, and it has some number of nodes, and I can get at the ith node. You'll notice this is not C++14. This is from 2008. And uh, it's got some nodes. And I can get the node index from the node. Uh, I can ask for the number of adjacent nodes, and I can get the adjacent nodes by supplying indices from 0 to the number of adjacent nodes. Now, this really should be const, but there's no room again, so I'm stuck. Um, so this thing returns 2. That tells me that this is node index 2. And there are two adjacent nodes. And here they are, 0 and 4. And so when I iterate over the adjacent nodes, I will get 0 and 4. OK, very simple. Now, I want to write the operator double equals for my graph. So what do I need to do? Two graph objects have the same value if. What are the salient attributes of a graph? OK, nodes and edges, but OK. All right. Hold on. The number of nodes, is that salient? OK. Number of edges, is that salient? How about the number of nodes adjacent to each node? Is that salient? OK, so I have a collection of nodes. They're numbered from 0 to n minus 1. OK? And each node is adjacent to another node if, when you iterate over the nodes that are adjacent to it, that other node is on the list. Do the indices have to be the same? So uh, I, get, I think, well, you may be getting ahead of me because I, I, we're going to get there. But for right now, the question, is, the question is, do the number of nodes adjacent to each node have to be the same? And I'm expecting people to say, yes, they do, without getting into what you're about to talk about. So to say, if I have that, then I also can sum them and have the number of of edges, right? That's what I'm trying to say. How about specific nodes adjacent to each node? Meaning it's not just the number, but you're a node, and I want to know exactly which other nodes are adjacent to you. And if you know that, then you certainly know the number of nodes, so I can take that away. In other words, we're, get, we're building this up to find out what is salient and what isn't. OK? So here I'm going to take a stab at this. And those are, by the way, those are fine points, and we will get there. Two graph objects have the same value if they have the same number of nodes n and for each node index i in this range, the nodes adjacent to node i in LHF have the same indices as those of the nodes adjacent to node i in RHS. That's clear, right? You may not agree with it, but it's clear. Yeah, good. So now adjacent node is the edge order salient. Now, what does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean? Now, if you have a, an adjacency matrix, there's no way to deal with it. It's just a flat yes, it is, or no, it isn't, because that's all she wrote. But if you have adjacency lists, the lists could be in different orders. Now, I'm asking you, for this application, is the order of iteration of adjacent nodes salient? It's a design decision. Is it or not? I heard a yes. Why do we need that? Why do we care? I'm sorry, I didn't understand the reason. Say it again. OK, but that's, that's, that's cyclic. We're designing this. We could either have the adjacency order matter or not. That's a design decision. Uh, 
Okay, so that, by the way, that was an argument for making uh, ordered, uh, unordered containers have the same iteration order because it's easy. But we didn't do that. Thank goodness. Okay, so we have someone who feels uh, that the order of, of, of iteration for the adjacent nodes doesn't matter. And as I said, if we're storing it as an adjacency matrix, it's off the table anyway because it's been normalized. So based on that, this is, this is, the, you know, this is the example. We could store, uh, let me just get back here. So, okay, so we're, gonna, we're, we're thinking maybe we're not gonna, we're not gonna make that matter. Um, if we were to store them as uh, ordered edges, we'd, we'd have um, a canonical order. If we store them as unordered edges using an unordered map, for example, um, the complexity would be higher but still faster uh, you know, if, we, if we kept them in an, in an ordered way. But it turns out that from a practical point of view, we would never do that. So we don't care about this little detail. Um, but yes, let's go with what you said, that uh, the, the order is not something we're, we're uh, considering. Uh, by the way, as I was saying, the, uh, uh, said it many times, so I'm not going to say it again. Uh, until 2010, we didn't have operator double equal, but finally I was somehow, at the last moment, uh, I, with Howard Hinnett's help, uh, was able to convince the, the, the standards committee that because it's named unordered container, that having the order be salient was probably not uh, the right thing to do. And I realized the reason was it used to be called uh, hash set or hash map. And back in those days, well, of course, it's a hash thing. So we know what it is, and it's, it's fine. But now that it's called unordered container, uh, that kind of changed the, the, the outward imagery of it. So that's fine. And this was in large part due to performance concerns. So this is, by the way, um, not regular, and for the reasons we discussed, uh, it, it isn't doable in linear time, according to uh, um, Stepanov. And if we didn't have the equal equal at all, it wouldn't be regular either, it would be semi-regular. But the trouble is, we didn't even have a notion of what value was for it, so it was worse than semi-regular, it was unspecified in some sense. Now it is, it's a good thing. But anyway, it's an excellent starting point to say that something isn't regular, but you know it's, it, it's, it's, it's regular except uh, it doesn't have this thing, or it's regular, it doesn't have that thing. Because once you want to describe, for example, a zebra, you say it's a horse, but with stripes. Or a horse is a zebra, but it doesn't have stripes. Something like that. If you have to explain a horse from scratch, uh, it's more difficult. I don't know if that's a useful analogy, but anyway. So let's go with this number of nodes Specific nodes adjacent to each node, but not the adjacent node, i.e. edge order, based on what we said. So how about the node indices, or the numbering of the nodes, which this gentleman over here suggested early on? Do you know what I mean by the numbering of the nodes? Okay, so I'm just going to add this little phrase. There exists a renumbering of the nodes in RHS such that, and now we have a graph, and uh, node index 3 here, that's... that's Great. And I have another graph over here, and it has the same topology, but the nodes that are stored in the, in the, in the graph, when you go to iterate over the nodes, they come out in a different iteration order. And um, are these two equal? Now, this is a design decision. What do you think? Are they equal? They are, but are they, are they this, do they represent the same value? Wait, we say, I hope they do. I hope they do. Okay, that's great. Oh, I love it. Now this is this is where this is where we could have a really interesting discussion. Um, suppose we decide that this is what we want, and we happen to be in a position of authority. We want isomorphic graphs to be equal. So we just tell our engineers, do it, because we're the boss. Do it. Okay. How about this other one? And. Uh, that was a little more confusing. I'm trying to figure out, is that really the same or not? Other one looks pretty clear, but this one's giving me a problem. So what do I do? How hard is it to compute whether these two things have the same value? Because we decided that if they're isomorphic, they have the same value. It's not linear. It's not linear. Okay, so let's talk about just how hard it is. 
Um, I, I borrowed this from Wikipedia a long time ago. Um, it's like this. Uh, it's known to be an NP and co-NP. Okay, it's not known, to be, not known to be NP complete. So it's not as hard as some of the other problems that we don't know how to solve. But unfortunately, it's not known to be in polynomial time either. It's in its own complexity class between the two, which might all be the same for all we know, because we don't know. But the point is it's hard. It's hard enough that for all intents and purposes, it's exponential. And if I had trouble getting, a, in a worst case, n squared, double equals into the standard, I, I think I'd have a really hard time convincing Howard that an exponentially hard double equals is going to fly. Am I right, Howard? He's with me there. OK, good. I would have a problem, too. So even if my boss told me I had to do this, and I knew that if my, the number of elements in my graph went from 20 to 40, that my system would hang forever, I might have to speak up. So no, we're not going to do that. No matter how much we want it, we're not going to do it. We're just not going to do it, because we can't do it. So we're going to write it like this, and just add this extra little thing in here that says, OK, uh, the uh, two graph objects have the same value. If they have the same number of nodes, and, and for each node index i, the ordered sequence of nodes adjacent to i in LHS has the same value as the one for node i in RHS. So that's it. And we're, we're either going to do this, or we could omit it entirely. And the reason for omitting it entirely is we can't afford it, and we don't want to get the semantics wrong. So given those two alternatives, we're going to do something else. We could provide it in a utility. Then we can do whatever we want, because we can document the utility to say, buyer beware, if you get bigger than 30, you're going to be waiting a long time. OK. So the answer is, we can't do it efficiently, or it's off message. Remember the, uh, the queue from the previous talk, if you were not here. There was a, a, a queue for multi-threading to coordinate threads. And the purpose for that was that it's a mechanism that helps do something. It's not trying to represent a value. That would be misleading. So summary so far, um, when selecting salient attributes, avoid selective domain-specific interpretation. Functions may be equivalent, but not the same. Graphs may be isomorphic, yet distinct. Triangles may be similar and still different. Don't editorialize on equality, especially operator double equals. We do not want that to have any cute meaning at all. It means what it means. And if it's anything else, we make it a separate thing. So subjective interpretations, put them in named functions, ideally at higher level components. So here's my util. Now, I put this here because it's a slide, but I wouldn't put all of these in one utility, obviously. They're in different utilities corresponding to their domains. We do use struct. We do make them static. Static is no longer deprecated. And as I said, I'm old school. And this has a lot of advantages. That's not the purpose of this talk. But one thing it does is when you don't want ADL and you do this, you don't get ADL. There are many other reasons, but to one side. This is a utility class category. Um, there's also a benefit in terms of terminology. It used to be people would very loosely say things like objects are the same, objects are identical, objects are equal, objects are equivalent, create a copy of. All of those phrases are absolutely meaningless. When you hear them, you should be very nervous uh, because you don't know if the other person even knows what they mean. Probably they don't. So don't say those things, ever. Instead, we're going to say exactly what we mean. OK, so objects or aliases refer to the same object, OK? The same object. They refer to the same object. If we mean something else, like objects have the same value we're talking about, they are substitutable with respect to their value. Or they refer to the same value. Or they represent the same value. We don't say that they're equals. Not equal. No, nope, none of that. OK. Um, Objects are the same. If we're talking about equality in particular, because we're trying to make a point, we would say something like, these objects compare equal, even though they don't have the same value. That's how we would say it. We wouldn't say they have the same value, even though they don't have the same value. But in this case, for value semantic uh, types, they mean the same thing. We would call out this locution to make a point. All right means have the same value. All right, 
Objects are the same equivalent in separate name functions. Fractions are equivalent. Graphs are isomorphic. Triangles are similar. And we're done with that section. Now, fortunately, we have a little bit of time. And I have only two um, use cases left. But they're a little bit bigger. Any questions right now? We good? It's OK? All right. So two important uh, instructional studies. Um, Regular expressions. Uh, what is a regular expression? Anybody want to take a shot? What is it? I know we have one in the standard. No? It's a, it's a notation to describe a regular language. An, excellent. It's a notation to describe a regular language. I like that. So a regular expression describes a language that can be accepted by a finite state machine, which is what was said, right? And here's an example. Binary numbers, one or zero as many times as you want them. At least one, though, right? OK, great. Why create a separate class for it? Well, you know, this is a decision that we have to make. Uh, is it, does it make sense? A regular expression class imbued with the value of a regular expression can be used to determine whether or not arbitrary string tokens are members of the language that the regular expression value denotes. So do we need an object to do this? Seems like a, an interesting thing. It's, it's, it's kind of like a functional value. Kind of, maybe. Now, people will argue, I will tell you right now, people that like functional languages would insist that regular expressions are, are values. And then there, there are other people on the other side that say, no, a regular expression is more like a mechanism, like a parser or something. And you know, there's not really a right or a wrong answer. But if you go down the route of saying that a regular expression is a value, then you have to play by value rules. So because this is a training exercise, let's, let's say maybe, maybe it should be. So here I made up this uh, little example. And I have a static function called isValid to check to see if a regular expression is valid. Because I don't like to create objects that are just going to throw because you didn't give it something valid. So this is the way I do it. So I say, OK, let me just check that regular expression. And the precondition on, on the uh, constructors is, is that it has to be valid. So I did that. And then uh, how about the creators? OK, I've got this regular expression that, do, that accepts nothing. So who knows if we need that? Um, I've got one that takes a const char star. I've got one that takes uh, another regular expression. So there's a notion of copy constructor. And I can destroy it, OK? Then I've got uh, manipulators. And in the manipulators, the first thing I have is my operator equals. And I'm saying I want to assign the value of the right-hand regular expression to the left hand, whatever that means. Uh, and then I want to set the value, again, whatever that means, based on some uh, const char star, which we presume is a valid uh, uh, regular expression. And then I've got this other one. Now, why do I have both? Well, in this case, if I don't know what's coming in, I'm going to want to check it, and I'm going to want to check the status. If I do know that it's valid, I don't want to check the status. And that way, if I get it wrong in a safe build, in a debug build, it's possible for a robust library to tell me if I have Set, set value if valid, which is sitting right next to it uh, in, the, in the header file, and I forget to check the status, there's no way for a robust library to say, no, nope, you got that wrong, because this is a wide contract and everything is valid in the sense that if it's not valid, I'll just return a bad status. OK, and finally, we have isMember. And isMember takes an arbitrary string not completely arbitrary because it can't have embedded mouths, but to one side. And it returns yes or no. So, so this could also have been called accept or matching. It didn't have to be called this. Which operations? Now, this is a real interesting question. Which of the operations here are salient? Think about it. I'm sorry? Is member is salient. Anything else? Think about the abstraction that we're trying to model. 
Now, mathematical abstractions don't have constructors. They existed before the universe was created and will continue to exist after it's gone. So construction is not relevant, nor is destruction. Well, now that's an interesting one. Assignment and set value. There are no variables in the mathematical world. They're just values, right? This is not a machine. In math, 3 plus 2 is another name for 5. It's a strange beast, but that's how it works. So really, we're not, we don't need those operations because the, the, the mathematical operation is I take a string and I take a regular expression and the cross product is a bool. And that's it. A function pointer that you modify. I'm not sure I follow that. When you say changing, when you say set value, um, you're changing this, this object is a variable that holds the value. Well, okay, so the class acts like a function. What, what I'm trying to say is when you go back to the, to the ethereal world, the platonic world, and you look at what are the operations that are going on there, the only operation that's mapped up there, the only one of all of these, is what? Just one. There's only one up there. So that's why I'm asking what are the salient uh, 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 operations? Is member is the only one. Now, this is, the point here is, think about what it looks like up in mathematical land. We have one thing, which is a string. We have another thing, which is a regular expression. We put the two together via an operation called is member or is part of language or whatever you want to call it. it. Could be a funny star or something. And then when you do that, it evaluates to meaning it is true or false. There's nothing else. That's how the mathematical world lives up there. When we come down to the programming world, now we've got all these fun things like variables to hold values. Remember, a variable holds a value or refers to a value or has a value, but it isn't a value. Anyway, not to, not to dwell on it too long, but the isMember function is the interesting one. That's what I'm saying. Okay, so we thought about this good. So should regular expressions represent a value? That's really what it comes down to. And is it a type or a mechanism? Is there an obvious notion of what it means for two regular expression objects to have the same value? So what, what could the value of a re regular expression object be? What could it be? It could be the string that defines it. So if it's the same string, they compare equal. What if it's not the same string? Right, so that's, that's a kind of annoying, right? I represented it with a, an extra space, and it's like, what up? So the only really real way to do it is to look at the machine and take the symmetric difference and state the function, and that's not computational. Look at the machines and take the symmetric difference. That sounds painful. It does, doesn't it? It sounds painful. All right. That's the algorithm. Okay. Well, I claim it. there is an obvious meaning for value here, and how should it be defined? The string used to create it? or the language it accepts. Is that another way of saying what you said? Yeah. Okay, how many people think it should be defined in terms of the string used to create it? Anybody? Okay, how about the language it accepts? Okay, that's the definition of value. Now, the final engineering question is, oh, this is a lot of my whining. Uh, I'm, voting, I'm voting for two because Really, all the other stuff is not salient. Um, I'm just throwing this up here for fun. All right. If we'd have pro provided an accessor, uh, we wouldn't consider it salient. The bottom line is, that is just a means to get the machine configured. Once it's configured, no one cares. By the way, it's the same as uh, iteration order in a map. OK. So finite autonomy might have been a better name for this. But we called it regular expression. Think about it. Finite automata is really what it is. And a finite automata is a variable for a finite automata value. 
Okay. Or language. Maybe we should have called it language or regular language. A lot of better names. Oh, well, that's to one side. Now, should such a class be regular? Now, what I mean by that is, remember this talk is about it ain't about the syntax. What it's about is, do we put in the operator double equals or leave it out? We've already decided it's, val it's a value type, but now we have to decide if we're going to put in operator double equals. <sighs> so, it's at this point that we, you know, it's late in the day. Where's my watch? It's late in the day. So, um, in honor of this very important question, I want everybody to stand up. We need to shake it off, so stand up. I'm going to explain how this works, and be honest. I don't want any, any, anybody sitting down slowly. Okay. In honor of uh, this very important question, I want you to sit down as soon as the complexity on the screen exceeds that of an operator double equals for this regular expression object, assuming that we're talking about value being the language. So here we go. Order one. No, that's not possible. So. And, oh, it's a fair question. N could be the number of characters in the input to the regular expression for fun. It's not all that important as long as, long as we're talking about something that we can quantify. It, it's, more, it's, it's, it's really going to be in the number of states internally. But um, what about now? Can it be done in order N? So you have to sit down. But you're sitting. At least you're an honest person. How about n, uh, n times n squared, or n to the 3 halves? Can it be done in log n, n log n time? Does anybody think this can be solved in n log n time? No. OK, can it be solved in n to the 3 halves? Oh, I see people sitting down. No, you sat down too quick. I said as soon as I go past it. You can stand up. I'll let you off. No, you got to. Okay, I'll I'll give you this so you can sit down now. So this is n squared log n. So everybody who thinks it can be done in quadratic time, sit down now. Excellent. Polynomial time. So anybody who thinks it can be done in n squared log n time, sit down. Okay, all of you are standing. How many people think it can be done in polynomial time? Ah. Uh, How many people think it's in NP? How many people think it's NP complete? Who's standing? <laughs> How many people think it's in P space? P space complete. Anybody still standing? Those who just sat down were right. It's P-space complete. So, Howard, what do you think? Should we make operator double equals a, uh, <laughs> a function on this or just maybe make it a, a free function somewhere else? Okay, fine. <laughs> I put up these Greek letters. There was something on the internet that I was pretty sure was completely wrong, but I didn't have the wherewithal to come up with all those Greek letters at PowerPoint. So I just moved them around till I thought it was about right. I do not promise that it's right, but it's not completely wrong. But it makes it look about as hard as it is. <laughs> All right. So P space complete. Clearly, no equality comparison operators for this one. Um, should we avoid value types where equality comparison is expensive? Should we just say, ah, forget it? OK, so that's exactly right. And one of the things that, that uh, Alex Stepanov was very clear about in his books was, no, don't shy. If you can't implement them because they're not implementable, you can still have a very clear mental model of what that would mean and then treat them that way. So that's fine. Don't shy away just because. All right. By the way, Alex also points out 
which was new to me. And I think I learned it from Sean Parent a, a couple, was it a year ago, at C++ Now. There's an interesting thing that uh, a, a copy construction and assignment never have a problem in terms of uh, getting the, the value across in linear time. That, that isn't the problem. The problem comes from trying to take two distinct representations of value and finding out if they're the same. That one isn't in the same category, and that's why uh, Stepanov has come up with a term called, uh, um, uh, what was it, regular? It was semi-regular. Semi-regular. And so if you have a semi-regular type, it's one of those beasts where the operator double equals is just too hard to implement. But it still has a very clear definition. All right. Discussion about this one? Any thoughts? So I, am I correct that the standard has the definition of double equal being the, the string that was used to create it? Is that true? Oh, that would be delicious if that's true. I was afraid that it was actually the string used to create it because I'm quite sure it wasn't the language it accepts. Okay, anything else? All right, we're on to our last example. This might be a little more practical, or at least it'll be, uh, I don't know, we'll see if it's worth anything. Um, priority queues. I'm going to assume that there are at least a couple of people in this room that could not right this moment, right now if I gave you a laptop, implement a priority queue before the talk's over. Is that true? Okay, so I'm going to do it for you. Just as a reminder, I, me too. All right, so what's a priority queue? Uh, it's a generic container that provides constant on access to its top pri priority element, defined by a user supply priority function or functor, as well as, supporting as well as supporting logarithmic time pushes and pops of, of queue element values. Does that sound about right? Anybody look at it a little differently? Okay. So these are the important operations. These are the operations that we're going to model. This is the mathematical type right here. It's just a spec, but that's it. All right. Salient operations. So we have an example here where I've got this, this nice little element value. It's called a labeled point. And the labeled point has a string label, and it has x and y coordinates. And, um, you know, kind of straightforward thing. And we're going to have a cost function that computes the Manhattan distance from the origin. And the Manhattan distance is explained there is you walk along either the x or the y axis, and whether you walk two, two uh, x and one y, or whether you walk one y and two x, the distance is the same, right? That's the priority. The string doesn't play. So these are the only two salient attributes of the uh, labeled point that matter in terms of priority, OK? Manhattan distance. All right, so now we have this queue. And thank goodness we have a real projector. The last time I did this, the bulbs had all faded, and the color was indistinguishable, and I was going to cry. But this is good. So let's take a look at this wonderful priority queue. Each element uh, is labeled with its calculated priority. So a lower priority value is more urgent, just so you know. The two is the most urgent priority, OK? Each distinct color represents an element having a distinct value. Now, this is worth thinking about for a second, because we have things that might have the same priority and different values. We might have things with different priorities and different values. What's the one thing that won't happen here? Yes, we won't have different priorities in the same value, same way we won't have different hashes for the same value. Does that make sense? OK. So now, we're going to look at the top element. What's the top element? The yellow 2, right? So there it is. If I call q.top, I get the yellow 2 by value. OK? Now, 
And by the way, when I said by value, I shouldn't have even said that because I could have gotten it by const reference because it's there. It's not going away. Never mind I said that. That was just lazy. Now, I see, I have a 3 and a 30, and um, are, these have different values and different priorities. Right? Okay. These have the same priority, but they're different values. So they're different, they're different paths through, or maybe they're the same path, but they have different labels. Okay. These guys have the same value, and therefore they have the same priority. These guys have the same value, different value, sorry, but the same priority. Different, different values, but the same priority, okay? Does it make sense? Okay, good. So now we're going to do a push. Now, I want you to appreciate how long it takes to do this animation. It is not even close to fun. We're going to put the two in, and then we're going to swap if the two if the parent and the child are out of order. And they are because the two needs to bubble up until it gets one that's at least the same priority. What I mean by that is the priorities are the same or this priority uh, is, is less than, yeah, like that. That's what I'm trying to say. So, so the, the, it's late in the day. The two and the, two and the 80 swap because the two is a more urgent priority than the 80. Now, if we look at the three and the two, should, should they swap? Yes. Now look at these guys. Should they swap? No. Good. Okay, now you're, you're experts. We have only one more function to implement. Pop. So we are going to, how do you think we do a pop? What's the first thing we're going to do? Okay, so we're going to get rid of that guy. Now we've created a hole. What do you think we're going to do next? Okay, you said the highest priority, but actually what we're going to do is we're going to select the element that's the furthest along in the linear array and move it to the top. And then we're going to, we're going to, we're going to bubble it down. Now, because this is a, a deterministic mechanism, if two things were the same, we're going to go left. So in this case, they're not the same. We're going to go for the one that is the more urgent. And so are we going to swap? OK, so we're going to swap. Now we're going to go for the one that's more urgent. OK? And now we're going to go for the one, and we're going to swap or not swap? Not swap. OK. We now understand how priority queues work, right? Now you could go implement one. If you had the slide deck, I bet everybody here could go implement one. Now, why create a separate class for it? Well, why create a vector or a map? So we'll, OK. Um, it's a useful data structure. Should it represent a value? Well, the whole point of this talk is to look for things that we can try to assign of a unique interpretation for, right? I don't want to assign an arbitrary value. So if there's a value that makes sense, let's go for it. By the way, value types are easier to test because there are very well-known patterns for testing them that take the kernel of the value type and do it in the same way every time and then use that kernel to bootstrap the rest of the tests. And that's what's good about class categories because we have very strong knowledge of how to deal with them. All right. So priority queue represents, oh, uh, is a priority class a type or a mechanism? Now, a lot of people could argue that it's, it's kind of like that queue that, that deals with, <coughs> with threads. Um, but then on the other hand, we could also say that given a priority queue and a push and an element, we're going to get another priority queue, and that operation is well defined. So in that algebraic sense, <coughs> excuse me, there is an ethereal type that we could use to model this. So is there an obvious notion of what it means for two priority queues to have the same value? <coughs> what do you think? Okay, put them out in the same order if you were to empty it. So that might be that might 
Same priority, okay. So if all the priorities in the queue were unique, that would be guaranteed. Okay. So I'm claiming yes. Of course, the elements have to be value semantic. So how should its value be defined? So somebody tell me, how, how do we define it? Are we going to define it as two priority queues have the same value if you pop them and the same elements come out? So they have to have the same number of elements, right? Would it be fair to say that they not only have to have the same number of elements, but they also have to have, like the Halloween candy, the same values? Because if there were two different values and you popped them, they came out, then you wouldn't have the same elements anymore. So it's like the Halloween candy, right? Is that fair to say? That there have to be the same number of elements and there have to be a correspondence between the elements value-wise. Well, okay, okay. So I might have stored the elements in different orders. Okay, so the, but the question is, we're good. The question is, if we um, want to, we want to know a minimum condition, a necessary condition. If I dump all the, the elements out of the priority queues right now, and I can't line them up pairwise and have them be pairwise equal, then they're not equal. That's a minimum. Okay. If we pop the priority queue at a minimum, they have to come out in the same order. Everybody agree? Yes. Is that enough? Okay. Why not? If the values are different but have the same priority, they could come out in different order. So, but my question is, if we know, because we can look inside, we know that these two priority queues, if popped, will come out in the same order. Let's say we can know that. Is that good enough? What? Okay, so, so push, push is a salient operation. We didn't talk about push, did we? See, that makes it harder. A lot harder. Ridiculously harder. Two objects in class priority you have the same value if and only if there does not exist a distinguishing sequence among all of its salient operations. That is another way of stating the fundamental property, essential property of value. This is really important in finite state machines. We know that there are distinguishing sequences and homing sequences and all these good things, but it's very simple. If there's a way to distinguish the two using the ethereal operations, they don't have the same value, right? I mean, come on, it's that simple. All right, should this class be regular or should it be semi-regular? You'd like to make it regular. Okay. Uh-oh, we have a no. Well, I mean, we could, but I don't want to. You don't want to. <laughs> All right. Well, there's only about 14 minutes left, and then you can, like, recover. Um, how expensive would it be to implement operator double equals? How, we, how What does it cost? Okay, how would we know? How, what, would be, what, would be the, uh, what would be the way in which we would determine whether these, there is no distinguishing sequence? That, this is the kicker. How would we determine that? I bet it works if you just read across the... If you just read it, so the, the underlying array. Yes. All right, so it's necessary the same number of elements uh, the number of respective elements, right? Sufficient. It's the same underlying heap order. That's good enough. So if they're the same underlying heap order, then they, they have the same value. Done. And the algorithms that are in front of it are doing the same thing. I mean, don't you put the algorithm to the left-right point of the 
Oh, no, 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 it's deterministic. We already said it's deterministic. So, <clears throat> do we agree on this much, right? We've got necessary and we've got sufficient. Now, is, is the sufficient requirement necessary? That's, that's the question of the day. I kind of think so. Oh, I like that. I kind of think so. I'm not prepared to bet. Excellent. This is great. So now let's, let's bring out our chips from the casino where I was Saturday night. Um, for example, both of these linear heaps pop in the same order, right? Of course. But so do these. And yet it turns out we can distinguish these two with pushes and pops. So take a look at this. How do we generalize for all all of them, every possible priority queue in the universe, we have to come up with an operator double equals that on the fly looks at this stuff and says, it's all good. Now, if we aren't sure, what if we're pretty sure? What if 99.99% of the time we know that if, uh, that it's necessary? But once in a while, it's not. Just once in a blue moon, it turns out that there's some funny thing that happens and there's no way to distinguish them. Would you implement operator double equals if you couldn't know for certain that it's 100% of the time, that it's necessary 100% of the time? Not if it's medical software, okay. Well, if we had this function and we didn't know, we could make it a free function we could put it somewhere else. But if it's going to be operator double equals, it's got to be real. Suppose it were true. Suppose a little birdie whispered in your ear that it was the case, that it was necessary. What is the complexity of operator double equals? You know that. Somebody told you. You rubbed a bottle and a genie came out and said, it, 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 it's true, you, you need to have the underlying heap order be the same. Why n log n? The array is already there, it's already in, in, in linear heap order. There are two of them. And we're saying that a genie told us that it was necessary that they be in the same linear heap order. Same number of elements, same number of each kind of element. Um, just iterate over the two arrays and compare them and we're done because if there's any difference it's no and if the answer is there's no difference then it's yes which is what you conjectured well the conjecture is a very good one it's order n except until very recently I was a conjecture for me too and then I had the pleasure of hiring this little kid from Google who was, uh, got into uh, Carnegie Mellon at age 11 and got a degree in theoretical computer science, and he wanted to go work at Bloomberg News, and somebody said, why don't you talk to John? And then I said, I got this problem for this kid, and he's gonna go do this. So I spent about an hour explaining all this stuff to him, and he went away for six days. He came back, and he told me some stuff. And I said, mm -mm, no, not quite. But it was very close. So they went away for another day and came back with something. He patched this absolutely horrific proof. Ah. Anyway. So then I passed it around and we refined it. And it's like that old story. Oh, it's obvious. <laughs> but he had the insight. And I want to give you a very quick sketch of this absolutely crazy breakthrough. So I have these two priority queues. Now, the, we, have, we have five minutes, which is plenty of time if you know this stuff. And if you don't know this stuff, it's probably not. But I'm gonna tr it's not that hard, just trust me. We have these two priority queues. And for simplicity, there's going to be a high priority, the blue one, and a low priority, the red one. The way I think of it is, the blue one is rocks, only gravity is this way. The blue one is rocks, and the red is water. Think of it that way. The water doesn't do anything. It's just, it's just there so that, that you, we don't have a, you know, a problem moving stuff around. Water, water is really like ice cubes, and rocks are like lead balls or something. I don't know, whatever. But anyway, the higher priority one is the rock. And now, 
What are we going to do? We're going to find, because if the priorities are the same in the blue, if they're actually just the same, then these are going to come out in the same order and there's no question we'd have to worry about that. So there has to be a difference somewhere in the priorities, right? There has to be a difference. And wherever, the, wherever there's a case where the higher priority is on the left and the lower priority is on the right or vice versa, that's the index into the array that we're going to focus on, okay? We, we, can we just agree for the moment that they have to be different in that way? Okay. And this extends to any number of levels, and we can do all kinds of extensions and whatever, but it doesn't matter, because once you can do this, you can do everything. Now, here's the magic. This is magical. We are going to put water into this thing. Until we get to the right subtree of that node position. You see it? We do that to both. That's, that's pushing water. Push water. Then, it's magic. We're going to push a rock. Same rock. And it's going to bubble up. Now notice, one of them bubbled up behind the other rock, and this one bubbled up through the water. Okay, you see what I'm saying? Did the same operation, went to the same place, but I, I constructively did something different. That one was blocked and that one wasn't. More magic. I'm going to put some more water in until I get to the right subtree. You see it? I'm going to put a different color rock in. Oh, by the way, for this to work, you need to have at least two distinct values for your rocks. If you don't have that, it's kind of hard to make the distinction. You don't need two distinct kinds of water. And then you do that. And now notice that the relative position, because we're always going to pull from the right when they're side by side, but there's no way for the other one to get through in front of it. So now what happens? Well, we can't, we're not quite done. There's some more magic that has to happen. And the magic that has to happen is we have n elements right now. So we're going to fill this thing up with another n elements of water just to make sure that nothing funny happens because we've got plenty of water in this thing, really deep. Now we're going to pop almost n times. And watch what happens. You see they're in a different order? Right now we can use top and distinguish the two. And if we go again, we're really, we're golden. So this is the constructive proof that linear order is necessary. Now what's the whole point of this thing? The whole point of this thing is the implementation of operator double equals is nothing. It's not about the syntax. It's about the semantics. And this is proof that it's about the semantics. What are you trying to tell us? Implementation is not the problem. I hope you, this makes that point abundantly clear. And should this class be regular? Of course it should. O of n discussion. You want me to, uh, I'll just finish up and I'll stay around. There's no discussion. It's a quick conclusion, right? What are we going to remember? Um, sometimes naturally represent a value. Should have a regular syntax. They should have proper value semantics. Um, only the object state is relevant. Should follow the essential property of value. Behave as if each value has a canonical internal representation. The big point on the last ones is there needs to not be a distinguishing sequence among the salient operations. And what I want to say here, and this is an interesting point that was observed, it's not about any of those operations. If something doesn't have a copy constructor or an assignment operator or a swap or any of those, none of those, it can still be value semantic, or it could have all of those and not be value semantic because some of the mutating operations don't follow the essential property of value. They violate the, the point that they, they supposedly have the same value here, but then you do the same operation and then they don't. So it goes both ways. It's, it's in the DNA of the object. 
every single mutating operation has to play or it's broken. If it's missing, this is another point. If I have a value semantic type and I remove mutating operations, it will still be a value semantic type, but not so if I add them. If I add them, I could break it, but I can't break it by removing them. So that's another important observation. Key takeaway, it doesn't have to do with the syntax, it has to do with the semantics, and a class that respects the essential property of value and doesn't violate the idea, ideas of distinguishing sequences uh, is value semantic, otherwise it's not. You can go look at a bunch of things that don't violate value semantics here, and that is the end of the talk. <laughs>